introduction, very kind introduction. And thank you for bringing me here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here. It's my fi first time to be in Indiana, and I'm very excited about presenting to this crowd, to be honest. So I actually then I decided to pack in uh, a lot more uh, recent stuff that uh, than I normally would have done. So I, I wanted to get more feedback from this crowd as well. So okay, so today I'm going to talk about an area that we have been really invested in for the last I would say two years ish, uh, and I'm going to talk through uh, not much detail, but some details about three things. Okay, so uh, three things. Uh, one is published. The other one is under review. Been under review for like two years. Uh, <laughs> as we talked, and the third one is really fresh, so we, I don't know when this is gonna happen yet, but okay, so three things. Uh, let me start by uh, turning into a meteorologist. Okay, so this is a, a, a typical weather report you see on TV. If you're on East Coast, you should have remembered that because this hurricane hit us really badly when I was in Boston. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen that, let me just tell you what exactly this means, okay? So this is a, a hurricane uh, forecast. So what this means is that for a hurricane started from Caribbean, people in New York knew well in advance when this is gonna hit New York, with what kind of probability, what will be its intensity when it hits, okay? So this also means that uh, when it comes to natural phenomena, we're great. We have developed a very comprehensive understanding that we now believe natural phenomena can be measured, modeled, and predicted, okay? So there are many benefits of doing this, of course. One is to avoid being this guy, right? When you see the storm in front of you, it's too late. You want the insights and the predict power that's given to you uh, uh, through data or model to help you make more informed decisions, right? So, uh, so you need to know when this storm is going to come and how big is it when it does come, right? So in a way or the other, you know, about three years ago or three and a half, I started to uh, think, you know, the logic works very much the same way when we think about success, okay? So when we think about success, we always think about the value and impact in the future. Think about you're making an investment, you're thinking about is the price going to go up or down in the future? If you think about hiring someone, you look at the CV of this person, you look at what this person has done, but in your mind, what you're really thinking about is, is the person going to be successful or not five or 10 years down the road, okay? However, there's one major difference between the two when we think about success. That is, when it comes to success, we often just rely on qualitative judgments. Yet, it seems not really difficult to make informed, correct decision even for experts. This is a great quote I love for Thomas and Edison back to 1889. Greatest inventor in our history. Uh, let me get it right. Fooling around with ordinary current is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. Okay. Yet, interestingly, about 10 years before he said this, uh, 1879, he finished the first successful test of electric light. So he was the very expert about electricity back then. Yes, he said that. Okay. And I also need to mention this great quote by you know Ray Clippers owner a former CEO of Microsoft Steel Bomber back to 2007. There's no chance that iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. But remember the second sentence, as if the first one wasn't enough. Let's look at the iPhone sales. This is about when, when he said that, and you know, don't, we don't need to mention what. He's, uh, he's, he, well, he was a former CEO of Microsoft. Now he's the owner of LA Clippers. Now look at how Clippers is doing. Uh, it's just this, I don't know if you watch it, I can't watch Clippers game just because of him. It's every time he's, ah, uh, feel bad for Chris Paul. But that's, that's another story, okay? Uh, okay, so, so that makes, you know, I, I've got so many examples like this, you, you wanna ask me, okay? So, so that really makes me wonder, you know, with the explosion of big data now, the excitement, now, with so much data that captures, uh, you know, individual performance impact in so many different domains, now can we look at success from a data-driven perspective, okay? Can we look at this from a quantitative point of view uh, using tools of network or data science uh, to think about quantitative signals behind success or hopefully early signals behind success, okay? Now, can one day, the idea is to think, you know, can one day 
we start to think about, you know, success can also be measured, modeled, and predicted. Uh, our optimism uh, came from uh, a hypothesis that success is not an individual phenomenon. Success is a collective phenomenon. For something to be successful, it's not enough for you or your parents or grandparents think you are successful. But everybody else has to all agree that you are successful. Everybody else has to all follow and endorse you. And if we accept it, that success is a collective phenomena, then there must be fingerprints in the data that capture how community collectively react to your work that we can then detect and quantify using tools of network and data science. Okay, so today I'm gonna show you three examples in this wing uh, that we start doing uh, some initial steps and now we're gonna fly through uh, other examples uh, that uh, you know we're also in this uh, area, okay? So first example is an example where success is relatively well defined, relatively well documented. That is the success of your paper or the impact of your paper is uh, to a certain extent right, captured by the citation of your paper, right? So this uh, falls very much similar to the way we think about a success, that the success of your paper it's not enough for you to self-cite it. Sometimes you get your initial mileage. That's not going to work, okay? So it's not enough for you to cite it, but everybody else have to all agree and we have to build on your work, okay? So if we think of this as an exemplary example, then can we start to use this example to think, help us understand more about success, okay? So it all started with this one single picture where I show you, uh, I, I, Papers published between 1960 and 1970. I randomly select the 200 papers uh, published in this uh, 10 years window. Each line here is a paper. The color of the line indicates uh, the uh, publication year of the paper. And uh, x-axis is time, y-axis is how many citations each one has. There's a one single message of this figure, that this is a mess. If I ask you, now I'm gonna block half of the screen, can you tell me what is going to happen next? And that seems to be hopeless. That's what we call the system is lack of predictability. Making the matter worse is the fact that citation, the well-known fact, citation follow bad tail distributions. So anything, paper can acquire between one to a thousand citations. There is no typical scale. If it were follow a Gaussian distribution, then we are all set. But there is no outlier, everybody is the same. The third uh, thing that will make it even worse is this well-known discrepancy between short-term impact and long-term success. What I mean is the following. X-axis, I'm gonna plot C30, which is how many citations you have in 30 years, how well you're doing in the long run. Y-axis, I'm doing C2, that's how many citations you had within two years. I'm gonna show you how much attention you got in the beginning. What do you see is that these two measures correlate, so that means better you are in the long run, better you were in the beginning, that's the good news. Yet, this correlation starts to break down at a certain point, above which this starts to decay. So that means the really influential work, groundbreaking work in the long run, have not really limited early impact. And we know many examples of them, right? And we know a lot more examples thanks to Sleeping Beauty study, which is beautiful. Uh, Right, and, and like uh, Steve, uh, the standard model paper, for example, got like two or three citations in the first two or three years, right? So, uh, so that makes us wonder, uh, sort of can we understand this system, right? So there's two, I uh, say, importance to understand it. Number one, this is fundamental challenge uh, for uh, uh, science policy because we increasingly, I'm increasingly comfortable uh, of using citation or any indicators to evaluate scientists, compare scientists, uh, tenure and promotion decisions, or assign grants and rewards, all these consequential decisions, we, inc we use it in an increasingly comfortable manner, then that raises question of can we understand it, right, before we use it. Second, uh, from a complex system uh, researcher point of view, this is really a fundamental challenge in complex systems, right? If you think about citation as a complex network evolving system, then this is really challenging uh, every one of us working in complex system are questioning our ability of seeking others in a system that is as noisy and unpredictable as a citation system, right? So uh, I'm gonna ask a, a simple question to start with. My first question then is, given a system that is a mass, looks like this, 
is there a, a, a generative model, mechanistic model based on all verifiable assumptions would be able to generate something that looks just like this? So that's my number one question. It uh, turns out there is. There are three fundamental factors that affect how a paper is being cited. Number one is preferential attachment. That is, a more better cited paper, a more read, has more likely to be cited again. So pi i, your probability to get cited is proportional to C i t, citation of paper i at the time t. Okay? Second is the aging effect. Fresh paper more likely to offer fresh ideas, but with time, its novelty is expected to fade away because it's being integrated by subsequent literature. What we find is that aging factor in citation system are best characterized by a log normal function, uh, uh, which is the most common function that describes the aging in complex system, uh, including uh, how long people survive after a cancer diagnosis, including how long a motor fails uh, 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 based on all their parts, and even including you know, how long a marriage lasts. I'm not suggesting if there's any correlation between the two, but that's still a, a, a lot normal function. Interesting fact to know. Okay, so the third mechanism is that paper differs inherently in terms of their audience size and, uh, uh, and, you know, and their likelihood to get cited or their quality, if you will. So the easiest way to model this, of course, then is to assign a constant to each paper that is not changing over time. So let's say there's a eta. So if there's three factors determines how a paper is cited, easiest way is then the probability for a paper to be cited is the multiplication of the three. Then we have a read equation formulism that on the left hand side is saying dc dn, that is as new paper come in, because that's the only way any paper will be cited, it needs to be paper, right? As new paper come in, what is the likelihood of paper i at time t to increase a citation? And that likelihood is simply your pi i normalized by everybody else. So luckily this equation can be analytically solved. The math is actually not that involved with anyone that has a network background to be able to do it. Uh, so what we arrive is this a single equation, a little funny, but it has three parameters. If you think of this as a typical uh, paper, then uh, three parameters are lambda, which is the fitness parameter. Mu is the immediacy parameter. Sigma is the longevity parameter. Fitness parameter really tells you, if you think of this curve, sort of how high you jump, okay? Uh, immediacy parameter is telling you how soon you are getting the attention. So that gives you a characteristic time scale for a paper. Sigma parameter is the longevity parameter because it normalizes time, so it says how quickly your attention decays over time, okay? So now we've got a, one equation, we've got a three parameters, then let me remind you, that means this equation right here makes a remarkably strong prediction because it says as noisy and unpredictable as we saw for citation dynamics of individual papers, they all follow the same universal function. And the difference between them is only the differences in terms of the three parameters. Okay, now that seems uh, very strong, now how do we test it? Here I'm selecting four papers published in the same year, in the same journal, and I select them for their obvious diversity in citations. Now if I know, uh, if I can learn the lambda mu sigma parameter, and if I rescale them independently, the time axis and citation axis, my theory should predict they all follow the same universal function, where the differences between them is just the differences in terms of different parameters, okay? So that four seems to work pretty well. Uh, then you're gonna say, in the sooner you try to uh, trick me, uh, not, so this is 8,000 papers in physical review, this is 1,000 papers published by Nature in a year. It seems, I mean, there's definitely old deviations, but it seems to work fairly well in this case, and the more journals, uh, I would say, you know, like this journal experimental method, there's some deviations, but in general, it, I think it, it fits remarkably well, surprisingly well, at least more surprising than I thought. Then, you know, that answered our first question is, Given a system that looks like this, if I were to be able to input the correct set of lambda mu sigma parameters, I can generate a system that looks just like this, but smoother, right? Because it captures the average. So that's the first question I raised, now I answered. Now that raises the second question, it's a question that we all face, so what, right? So I'm gonna show you uh, two examples for the time being. The number one so what question is uh, the ultimate impact. What I mean is the following because this is an analytically solved equation, 
then as any physicist or a recovering physicist, first question you will say is what happens t goes to infinity, right? Then if this question t goes to infinity, that means the area under the curve, that means the total number of citations a paper will ever get, that is the ultimate impact of the paper. We had a three parameters. When we take t goes to infinity, we realize only once arrived, that is the fitness parameter. That means when it comes to your ultimate impact, uh, does how soon you're getting the attention or how fast this decays, those things do not matter. Only one parameter that predicts ultimately how many citations you got. Now the question is, then so what, right? So here what I'm doing is to select the papers from three different journals, Cell, PNAS, and PRB. They cannot be more different, right? Now if I select different journal papers, I find this is a fitness distribution. If I select papers with the same fitness, let's say lambda equals to one, Let's look at how their citation changes. Years, year one, cell paper went ahead, perhaps because cell is more visible and has a lot higher impact factor. But with time, we see a remarkable convergence of citations among these papers. And indeed, that's what we predicted. If you have the same fitness, over time, you will have the same number of citations. It does not matter where you were published, okay? In contrast, if we select the usual suspects of number of citations at a certain time or impact factor of a journal, all these measures, one common characteristic of them is that when you select papers with same indicators, with time, their difference will just become bigger and bigger, right? So therefore, ultimate impact is the first uh, indicator we know that is journal independent that is predictive for long-term impact. Secondly, you don't need to think about, uh, you know, uh, ultimate impact. What you can do is this uh, wider forecasting approach, right? We can say, I'm gonna train, I'm gonna observe five years of your citations. Based on that observation, I will be able to think about, you know, what is the likelihood for this paper to adopt a parameter lambda mu and sigma, right? What that likelihood function does is then translate into this Cornwall predictions that tell you for this paper, given what we have observed, what is this likelihood to take certain citations over time? And we can do this for every paper as long as we have enough data points, right? So the right line indicates this is a, a, this, this is most likely path this paper will take, right? So as we increase the training period from five to 10 years, we see two things. Number one, the cone shrinked. The reason being, we had more data, so our estimation of your likelihood become more confident. Number two we find is the accuracy increase. For example, in this case, it was barely making the, the lower bound of the cone, but in this case, the, the dots didn't change, but the cone changed that enclosed it this time, okay? Now, what I want to make sure we understand it is that if we shrink t train, training time, time what happens is then the cone is huge, right? Then it will be easy to mistake it as, you know, then your method is useless because the cone is big. But what I want to say is when the cone is big, that by itself is a useful message, right? That means this is not really predictable at this stage. The uncertainty is huge, okay? So, uh, so given this, let me wrap up for this study. Uh, empirically, we observe a remarkable variability in individual papers citation trajectories. And I showed you a mechanistic model based on verifiable assumptions that can capture largely this citation variety. And then I can show you, I showed you long-term predictability uh, and citation predictions for individual papers. This also provides a, 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 a interesting framework to help us understand, you know, what is the trade-off between short-term impact and long-term impact for aggregated papers. Either this is a journal or this is a scientific field. I don't have time to get into it, but here are some references that perhaps are interesting. Okay, so that's the first study. Now moving on, just built directly on this, that makes me wonder of this question. That uh, this is, so this is person randomly selected, no, uh, not really, uh, who is relatively successful in getting cited. Uh, so I uh, have a, over 100,000 citations, oh Jesus. Uh, uh, but let me remind you, this is like three years ago. So now it's a lot more. Okay, so this is a person who is getting cited. Now if we think about an individual uh, profile or individual career, 
that's a combination of all these papers. If you think of this as a naive view of a career, right? Now, if we think of this as a combination of different papers, now if we understand how each paper evolves, then the question is, can we now understand how a career works, right? So, uh, and the idea, of course, is not, uh, you know, it's not to try to hire him right now. I think it's gonna be difficult for any institution. But, you know, uh, perhaps back then, it would be a lot easier to hire, for example, right? Now, to what degree can we identify a promising career, and to what degree this is a predictable, right? So, and you know, many different examples. Now, if we have a lot of data, now we can really look at this. Okay, make sense? So I'm gonna share a study that was really pioneered by one of my collaborators. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that, my, my peer just to advocate this. So one way to look at a career, here's the one way, right? This is one view of a career. X-axis is time defined as number of years passed after your first publication. Y-axis is citation in 10 years, so I'm controlling for how long you're getting the citation. Okay, so each bar here indicates I published a paper. Uh, the height of the bar indicates how well the paper is doing, right? So this is what I, uh, now if uh, given a career then it's well defined, there's always the best paper for you, being even if this paper is just 10 citations, if it's best for you, then that's your hit, okay? So every career will have a well-defined bias paper, and that is your hit, okay? So this is why I call, uh, if we look at this, then this is why I call the HOPE project. The idea is, are there quantitative signals of an impending scientific hit? Can you, what is the likelihood to shoot for you to produce another scientific breakthrough once you have a major discovery? Right. So uh, in other words, is there a still hope or are we that scientifically speaking, right? So, so that's the first uh, question I wanted to ask. And, and, and what we want to look at first is to look at the timing of the hit. When does it occur of a career? This ties back to a rich literature about the link between age, productivity, age impact, and age and creativity. Okay, this is a huge line of literature. The idea is that this is more likely to occur, your hit is more likely to occur around the mid age of your career than it starts to decay afterwards, okay? So when we're seeing something, this is what we measured in the data. I'm not trying to argue what this uh, shape should look like. I'm not trying to make a story out of this because that's the other least issue. What I'm trying to do here is then to think about, take another view of this. If we take, now we measure this, right? This is how we measure it. it. looks like after 20 years, this is dangerous because the probability decays. Now, I'm gonna keep your career as it is. Every time you publish paper, you publish paper. But what I'm gonna do now is to shuffle the height of those bars, okay? So I'm gonna keep all your publication time fixed, all your total papers fixed, all your total number of papers, total number of citations are all fixed. I'm just gonna shuffle all those papers in time. Then for all these people, I'm gonna measure this again, and this is what we see, right? So these two curves fall right onto each other. So what does this mean, right? So this means what we capture here is really a convolution of age profiles of the sample and the age dynamics along the career in terms of productivity. What we see here is that the timing of your hit is really random. And what this delivers is a very positive message that there is still a hope, right? Your, your best work can happen anywhere for your first work, which is the block case for the wave function, right? Or your last work, right? Or anywhere in between is all a constant probability. And what drives this is really productivity, right? So as long as you're being productive, then there is still a hope, right? The best work is yet to come. Okay, good, let's just leave with that today. Okay, okay. good, so, so this, what we call a random impact rule, the highest impact of your work is random distributed. And what, why is that useful? That helps us construct a null model. If it's randomly distributed, then we know what we should expect, right? Then that gives us really what I call three laws of scientific excellence. First, timing of your biggest hit is entirely random, we talked about that. Second is this, Quality begets success. That is, if I look at how well you did before the hit and how well you did for the hit, what you see is a positive correlation between you. The better you have done, then the better is the hit, okay? And the random impact rule tells us this increase is not accounted, it's unexpected given the random impact rule. 
Okay? Second is the, uh, the third one is this. Productivity begets success. That is, the more you publish, the better it's going to be for the hit. Okay? And this correlation is not uh, captured by the random impact model because inherently this should be correlated. The more I draw from something, the extreme value of statistics will tell you the better will be my best work, but this is not predicted by the random impact model. And the, why the deviation of this help us to construct another model, and we realize the way, the only thing that's missing is that we need to assign a one extra parameter that captures different scientists. You can call it the whatever, let's call it the Q parameter, okay? So what this parameter does is very simple, is to tell you, I'm gonna draw randomly from a pool of knowledge. But people, once we get that knowledge, people who, the ability among individual scientists to translate that into different uh, work of different variable impact, that is different. A small Q scientist will draw something even if it's a great idea, but if Q is less than one, it will have a sort of diminishing the, uh, the value of that. But high impact scientists, every time it draws it, it will multiply the impact of eventual work that's being published. Okay, so, so that means, so if we think of this cumulative distribution as a way to characterize distribution of different works within a career, uh, right people is the high impact per person, the, like the person we saw earlier, or the low impact person is the blue person. People, well, what we see is that this, although these three people have almost the same productivity, the high impact person will just every time draw a random number, but because the Q is high, every time I multiply it, I have this consistent pattern of excellence along my career, okay? So although this person keeps drawing the number from the same pool, but you know, it's not, the, the results is not so uh, promising, right? Okay, so what this helps us to de develop is then the first uh, analytical thinking of a career, is to think about a career from an analytical perspective to make certain predictions, for example, collapsing. If the variance between different uh, career is one parameter, then if we normalize this, then we can collapse them in a much closer manner. Or to think about, you know, what we should expect for uh, things like H index to increase as N increases. What is the theoretical prediction behind this? Because we always talk about H index, but we never really understand the measures analytical thinking behind it, or, you know, given papers you have published, then I can perhaps learn your Q index, and what that tells us is to have this, again, a weather forecast approach of, you know, what is the uh, envelope prediction for your future citation impact, for example, okay? So, so this enable us to do something like this, right? and I want to mention this, uh, this is really work by Roberta Sinatra, who is, uh, you know, a tremendous collaborator of me. Uh, she really did the most of the work. I'm, you know, I'm second author on this, so I wanted, but I wanted to sort of get the message across, especially for this crowd, so sort of give you a sense of this, okay? So now, uh, moving on to the third one, uh, I want to talk about a different thing that started from this one single picture. This is a picture published by NBC. This is the Pope picture. Somebody, so this is the Pope, as when he began the Pope C and ended the Pope C for eight years across, somebody took a picture at the same spot, okay? And, and as you can see, it, it really struck me when I saw it and really motivated me for this project. But you can see a lot of things happen, right, within eight years in the society. I really like the fact that this guy is taking a picture, right? This guy's trying to take a picture, that's really cute. Uh, so uh, this picture really struck me, and I, I'm just, for two years I couldn't put a finger on, put my finger on, you know, what is it about this picture? So I keep asking myself, what is it? Why is this interesting? I think it's interesting, no? Huh? It's interesting, right? So then the question seems to be uh, iPhones. Okay, that's. Almost the same. That's, that's not where I, okay. So I wanted to, I wanted, to, so now perhaps the question is then ask, you know, how many of you have a phone in your pocket? Can you please raise your hand that you have a phone? Everybody seems to have a phone. And that seems to be my first question, that's where it's interesting. Then until I realized that's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is that how many of you 
for the phone in your pocket, how many of you had another phone before this? Whatever that phone is. Okay, so none of you, how many of you this is, the phone in your pocket is your first phone ever? Zero, that's good. How many of you right now have two phones in your pocket? Kind of, that's good. So, so let's say finite number of phones. Okay, so it looks like the question I was really looking for is, it's not about people didn't use iPhone, now people use iPhone or some variants of that. It's really about everybody here, they have something, they have the same category of product in their pocket. So it's really about they were using something and now they're using something else, okay? So it's really about, uh, it's really about sort of you have something new that substitutes for something that is old, okay? And the consequence of that, of course, is once you adopt that, then you wouldn't be able to get another phone at the same time. So, so the substitution also happens at the expense of, you know, you cannot do uh, any other alternatives. Now, if you start to adopt this view of this picture, then you start to realize the evolution and progress and functioning of different systems in our society or history, it really follows a lot of these patterns like substitutions. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Let's think about first, uh, in the area of scientific instruments, we have telescope, right? We look at telescope, it's beautiful picture by Hubble, but that's not the first telescope, right? Back to Galilei, he had a telescope, that looks like this, but not very powerful, but that was the instrument, right? Then later on, you know, Kepler used uh, a more improved uh, telescope, right? And then, you know, there comes the refractor telescope. I think this guy's Hubble, so he had a reflecting telescope. And then we had, you know, this is the, the one up on Hubble Monarchia. This is the Hubble in the space, right? It, you know, so instruments progress by substitutions. We had something, and then we have something much better, okay? Once we use that, we cannot use anything else. So that's instruments or any piece of equipment Laptop is like this, MP3 is like this, right? Now let's think about beliefs and knowledge, right? So this is a view of a world back to ancient India, right? Uh, so we had a huge giant turtle in the end. In the bottom, then we have four uh, elephants that's carrying the world, right? So the elephants make sense. I don't know why there needs to be a turtle. <laughs> Maybe provides the cushion. And then somebody comes in, and uh, we, we used to believe them. So then somebody comes in and says, you know, that's, I think that's a stretch, right? It's not really that. Let me tell you what it is, because we're the Earth, we're in the middle, and you know, everybody else circles around us, right? Then there's a the moon, and then there's a Venus, and the sun is in between Venus and Mars. Outside of Mars, nothing else, it all stars, okay? So that's another view of the belief, but we didn't just have that, we had something before. And some of this, of course, that's not even close to what it is. We're opening the sun, uh, all the time. We're not in the middle. And now we know, of course, this is not even close, right? We have so many other stars. It's not just my uh, planets, right? Okay, good. So knowledge and belief is like that. We substitute the new, the old with the new, okay? Let's think about human conflict. This is how we fight, if you remember, right? Bow and arrow, right? Of course, we don't do that anymore. Then we had a little something that's more advanced, right? Then we have something even more advanced uh, that we fight that nobody now go to a war with this, right? It's not gonna work. Uh, now we have, of course, the jet, we have aircraft carrier, and eventually all of this will be substituted by this, <laughs> right? So, so, so this through substitution, right? So that's another example. Uh, think about energy, right? This is how we harness energy from the wood. Then we realize, you know, this coal that is much better. And let's use this. Uh, hydroelectricity, uh, which is much better. Now we realize uh, this petroleum that's really giving us a lot of mileage. And let's think about natural gas, clean energy in the terms of wind view. I should have taken a picture when I drove here from Chicago. It's beautiful wind uh, energy there, right? I mean, this is uh, nuclear energy. Uh, in terms of energy, it's also like that, right? In fact, if you think about even the most canonical case of adoption, we think about the Rogers cornfield. Rogers, for, if you, for those who don't know, Rogers was this uh, uh, farmer in Iowa, which is the most famous state last week. Uh, so 
uh, so, so he was the, the whole story when he started this book was that he's, uh, there's a new crop technology came in town uh, in terms of planting the corn crop. And his dad didn't adopt it, but the neighbor did. So next year, the neighbor had a lot better yield, right? But what that means, we didn't really think about that, is that when we adopt a new crop technology, it's not like we didn't plant anything before, right? It's really about we substitute new for the old. And once we adopt this, we cannot plant anything else, at least for this year. So if you think, if you adopt this view, then it looks like this isn't really adopted. Everything we talk about, it seems to be a, a substitution, okay? Uh, so not everything is substitution, but it looks like a lot of things are, okay? So once you adopt this view, then you start to look at agriculture, look at energy, social capital, public health, beliefs, ecology, knowledge, technology, medicine, human conflicts, uh, instruments. All of this seems to evolve through substitutions. Yet we know almost nothing about it. If you'd ask me how does substitution work, what is the empirical pattern for that, I had no idea. So this is the question I told my student. You know, this is so pervasive, and we have so much data now capturing everything. Why don't you go find data, let's analyze it. And I sent him straight through one year of deep depression. And the reason seems, turns out to be, it's tremendous hard to get any data about substitution, mainly for three reasons. Number one, three challenges. Number one is substitutions normally happen in the beginning or the end of the life cycle. So what that means is that requires your data to out requires your data to outlive whatever you study. Okay. Number two is that uh, substitution implies this implicit uh, assumption that if you substitute for others, then you can't use anything else. Right? So this ignorance of the alternative. So you need to have the alternatives. You need to have a complete observation in the category. If you just say Facebook substitutes for nice space, it will not work if you only have Facebook data. Right? Okay? So in fact, this is if so car example is the canonical example in adoption to think about a new car comes in, how so it's a typical example of substitutions. We'll never be able to observe it because, you know, first two reasons. But also, in fact, this is not even for a uh, complete site. If you think about complete site, there are a lot more. And this issue is very important because the well-known heterogeneity, popularity of this follow a fat tail distribution. Third challenge is that we need individual history to make causal influence on what substitutes will work. Otherwise, if you just observe the downward trend of something and the upward trend of the other thing, you have no way to verify if this is a causally one substitute for the other one. For this many three reasons, even for data that satisfy the first two, it will be uh, difficult to get the third one, okay? So, and, and so I keep thinking, where do I get the data? And turns out we had the data. We had the data in the example I gave you in the beginning. That is the cell phone example, okay? So if you think about cell phones, uh, if we take the data from, you know, a Nordic uh, Europe country, the first adopters, then cell phone typical lifetime is about two years. So significantly, we have a much longer period than the typical life scale. Uh, cell phone in, is in such an interesting sector of the economy, the telco economy, uh, that uh, the telcos, telecommunication companies, they play an interesting role in that they sell the product and they then maintain the usage of the product. So they both sell phone. They sell the phones and then they check the usage, right? So what that means is that all the cell phones in their network, they know exactly when they sold, it was sold and how often it's used. So in that, we'll give you a complete set of all possible technologies in this category. Third one is that the portability of phone numbers uh, across different phones really tell us this person uh, so stop using this phone and then start using this phone on this day, right? So really give us a causal influence of what cell phone substitutes were. What did iPhone 3 substitutes for, right? So looks like this is the first in a kind of data we were able to get our hands on about substitution. And it looks like this, uh, part of it, okay? So what you see here is that each node is a phone. And the size of the node is about how many people are using it. And if you, uh, like me, uh, bought a 3GS and then bought an iPhone 4S, 
then you will be contributing a flow of this error, right? So that means iPhone 4 I substitutes for 3GS. What you also see a remarkable diversity in the number of possibilities that we can substitute or different products being substituted, right? So, and let me also remind you, I didn't have the animation yet for this, but this is a remarkably dynamic process. That is, if you look at this system again in three months, it looks completely different, okay? That's how dynamic it is. Then the question is, can we make sense of this, right? What are the laws and reproducible patterns underlying a system like this, okay? So, to make sense of that, then we need to think about null models, right? What do we know about this? And the null models, there are many null models about substitutions. We have the models, make no mistake, we have the models for over a century. Back to, uh, you know, the logic uh, who is whom, uh, predator prey model, feature prey model, and also, you know, other diffusion models. And even epidemic models is this class. So we had models for a century, but we never had an observation. The holy grail of all these models is this, JIJ, that the, the width of the error, how many go from I to J, proportional, it's determined by II and IJ. Make sense? If you have more people in II, it will be more likely to be substituted. If you have more people in IJ, you're more likely to go there, that's preferential attachment, right? So that's the holy grail. The challenge is, we have never tested this, right? That's the question number one is, does it work? Now what we can do is to verify, you know, JIJ, plus versus II, it seems to be linear. That's good. So I'm gonna normalize JIJ by II and plot with IJ is again a linear function. So that means the model in this assumption actually holds fairly well. So this is the first empirical test we're able to do on this, okay? Now the second question is because all these models assume II and IJ are the sole mechanism for driving JIJ. Now the question is, are these two enough? What we can do is to normalize this, Sij equals to this, and then look at the distribution of Sij. If this is a normal distribution, then yes, it is enough, right? And what we see, of course, is not like that. This follows a fat tail distribution. Most of them have very small substitution rate. That's what we call substitution rate. And occasionally, there are high, much, much higher substitution rates than we would expect from this model. Right? Now that raises the question of what happened, what causes this? Now the hypothesis is simple because, you know, technology coexists with different level of freshness. So the small ones are like this. The big ones, uh, substitution rates higher than expected are like this, right? Simple. So then what we can test this is then because the data has so many phones, so many different kinds of uh, records, millions, millions of records, then what we can do, let's do a conditional probability. I'm gonna condition on tau j, that is the substitutes, the age of the substitutes. I'm gonna group all the substitutes at 60 days old, 90 days old, up to 540 days old. Then I'm gonna look at this distribution again, okay? See if the heterogeneity disappear. Make sense? What we see is this. Number one, as we increase tau j, this curve systematically shifts to the left. So that makes sense. As your substitutes becomes older, the substitution rate on average decreases, okay? But what we also find is that within the same tau j category with, by controlling the age of substitutes, there's still a fat tail distribution, so heterogeneity persists, okay? So what we also find is if we rescale Sij by, by tau j, simply by tau j multiplying on it, we see seven curves fall onto each other, collapse onto each other, okay? So very nicely collapse. So what this means is that, you know, this heterogeneity capture, uh, is the heterogeneity we observe in Sij can be really separated into two forces. One is the, the temporal force by tau j, okay? Once you remove that, everything follows the same universal function, okay? So we uncover the first scaling, which is Sij proportional to tau j minus one, which is the aging effect. As the substitutes age uh, become older, then your substitution rate scales as t minus one, okay? Now, if we instead control tau i, we think about the age of the ones being substituted and repeat the same analysis, what we find is that these, all these curves, actually eight curves, they automatically collapse on each other, very surprising. So what this means is that when it comes to ones being substituted or 
uh, discontinued. It doesn't matter you bought it, uh, you know, 20 days ago, uh, half a year ago, or two years ago. The substitution rates follow the same universal function. So that once again demonstrates the dynamics of the system is really driven by substitution. So it's really about new things come in and will substitute you. Okay? So that's the first law I wanted to uncover, uh, which is the aging effect. You see a distinct age pattern between the two, and that means that once being substituted, this curve is really just driven by uh, this ii times ij. There is no, this is the inherent uh, consequence of that, okay? Secondly, let's think about beyond mean field models because we, had no, we never had any observation, so uh, the models inherently are mean field. By mean field, I mean this. If I think about I'm, I, I, uh, I'm at I and who is going to substitute me, I don't care who it is because it's a mean field. So if I were to measure a quantity called Nij, that is number of J users who used I before, number of J users who used I before, because I don't care what I and J is, this is simply proportional to Ij. If more people are using J, then there will be more uh, J users who used I before. Make sense? So this is precisely the mean field of, uh, prediction. So that means if I were to do uh, normalize this, I plot Pij equals to n divided by Ij, and plot against the substitution rates, I should expect a nice flat curve that is independent of this. Make sense? So this old model predicts this. Let's look at what happens. What we find is with or without controlling for the age of substitutes or the ones being substituted, we see this curve automatically always increases. So what this means is that as we see more people going from I to J, the substitution rates from I to J also increases. So if more people go from iPhone 3G to iPhone 4S, taking into account I, 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 J, tau, I, tau, J, the likelihood going from iPhone 3G to iPhone 4S also increases, consistently increases. So this is the second mechanism we uncovered, we call preferential substitution mechanism. Right? As more separate substitution takes place, and more uh, it will be substituted, okay? So combining these two new mechanisms we uncovered, we'll have a new model that corrects over whatever we have uh, before by integrating directly these two mechanisms. And this new model makes a lot of predictions. I don't have time to get to this, but uh, for one thing, we have been really interested in the diffusion of innovation community is the idea of, you know, how many people are using certain things and sort of this mean field approach. But if we are, we have a deeper level of substitution pattern, then, you know, if you talk about how many people are using a cell phone I, then it's simply sum over uh, all the people that I substitute for minus all the others that substitute for I, right? Then we can just solve this and, you know, arrive a new set of analytical equations of I, I, and because, you know, we started with uh, sort of much deeper substitution level, you know, then we can make a bunch of predictions that fits, uh, you know, I would say surprisingly well in terms of different, so if, so that means we have one set of parameters to characterize one product, and then we can fit for different kinds of products, and we can say that simultaneously one set of parameters predict all these lines, either sales, popularity is how many people are using it, discontinuous is how many people stop using it, or it will take the derivative of this smooth curve. It looks much noisier, but the line seems to fit, you know, fairly well for all this, okay? Uh, some more predictions I didn't have time to get to, but, you know, the idea of this is substitutions. First, I want to represent this is a remarkable deeper complexity. We can make sense of this helping us uncover aging and preferential substitution mechanism. And what that enables us to do is to build empirically grounded and perhaps more robust and accurate predictions that we can make, okay? So this is really my graduate student, Ching Jing, uh, who followed me from Northeastern now in Penn State. So yes, so, so he, he's been doing a lot of this, okay? So, so let me just quickly, just not mentioning you know, what I did, but just give you an idea of what else we're interested in. One thing is, you know, to think about how uh, environments or institutions shape success or impact, right? So one question, is this hypothesis, right, is Harvard the ideas where go to die, right? So it's, it's that if you go to a better place, 
then are you, then you have better access to uh, ideas and colleagues, right? Support, prestige uh, attracts better students. Are you doing a better work, right? So that's a question that drives us. And the reason we can do this is really now we have publication affiliation information. Now we know exactly what you did in one institution. Now you moved. We know what you did in the other institution. We know what the impact is helping us understand it. So this is a student I helped supervise when I was in the lab uh, did this work. Uh, citations here, okay. Uh, you know, also, you know, things about uh, now we have an understanding of dynamics of papers and citations. Can we use models like this to help us uh, understand the influence and evolution of the field and also untangle the short-term impact and long-term impact of uh, a field? This is just a fun, a uh, playful piece that we uh, worked with uh, nature physics on this to understand how physics has been evolving. Uh, uh, or, you know, this information science side, uh, to think about, you know, the new knowledge, how do we now create a new type of visual systems that we can help others to use and understand a career and how to the sort of new visual challenges that we can build the system, right? Uh, or, you know, on social media, a lot of things are happening on social media. How do we foresee something like this? Is, like, is, is he still a hero in Korea? <laughs> you know, how, how is it possible, right? Three billion views in like three months. And could we have foreseen it? How do we understand it? And you know, what is the modeling perspective to understand like retweets and things like that, right? Uh, or in collective public opinion domain to think about, you know, we have been, uh, Every decision has been influenced by collective opinion. Even either this is about writing, reading a book, go to a restaurant, or watching a movie. Always see what others think before we form our, our opinion. And a great work by Duncan Waltz, Sinan Narao has demonstrated that affects us. Our approach is simply to ask if our opinion is shaped by others' opinion, then is there a signal we can detect in terms of how opinions evolve? to project future opinions, okay? So this is a piece in KDD 2014. Uh, what I really proud was this 111 paper. I finally got a 111 paper. <laughs> wasn't easy, but, uh, okay, so uh, you know, it's a fun piece. If, if you're interested, check it out, okay? So let me close out my talk with a little story I call 10%, okay? So if you are, if you're into uh, all your drilling business, okay? Um, you will be very familiar with this number, 10%. Uh, before World War II, this is the success rate of oil drilling. Okay, so we, you have a rough idea of there will be oil, you set up a whole team, you go there, start drilling, yet 90% of time, come back, it will be dry. Okay, your idea tells you, your hunch tells you, there may be oil, your experts tell you, you go drill the oil and it's dry. Okay, and because of the profitability of oil drilling business, we tried many things to improve that, okay? So we tried uh, petrol engineers, for example, sharpen the drill, and you know, they, we, we analyzed, you know, these are the cases we got the oil, these are the cases we didn't. Looks like the ones that we got the oil, there's a mountain on the east side, and there's always a river going from north to the south. That's just an example, right? So we tried many things, uh, but, this 10% number remained remarkably stable over years, okay? Now, over the next 75 years, now you look at oil drilling business. This number improved about 60%, okay? So that's a six times improvement, okay? Now you ask, what happened, okay? So it turns out it wasn't because of hydro engineers. Uh, what happens is the whole bunch of geological researchers who are just studying the structures in the earth, the rock structures and the structures underneath the earth. As they study this, they find there are certain structures underneath the earth that are the necessary conditions for oil, okay? So all these theorists, they had no idea how to drill an oil, no idea how to operate the machine. But what these theorists did are two things. Number one, it gave a new meaning for the data that petrol engineers have been looking at all along. Number two, it gave a theoretical guidance of if you want to drill oil, these are the data you ought to look for, okay? Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, uh, even a recovering physicist or 
information slash computer scientist. Why are you interested in success, right? I mean, what are you doing? Uh, I, I, I think the idea uh, here is really to bring the same useful theories ge geological researchers once brought to oil business. It's really to understand you know, the mechanisms that drive success. So one day we can bring this understanding to innovators, entrepreneurs, administrators, policy makers, or any decision makers, the same useful theories to help us understand success. Today we still don't have uh, you know, the guaranteed guide for oil drilling business, but we have 60%, and most importantly, for the 40%, for the ones that didn't strike oil, we actually now know why they didn't strike oil. So therefore, what I want to educate in our quantitative understanding of success, it's not about 100% success rate. That would be nice if we do, but it's really about the deep understanding of mechanisms that drive success. Only if we understand the mechanisms, then we can make predictions that are predictably successful. Right? Then we can derive metrics that are quantifiably reliable. Okay? So with that, I want to mention this is, you know, tremendous collaborative work. Uh, we're supported by Air Force, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, advertisement shamelessly. We're putting together, painfully putting, we're putting together event on March uh, 22nd, 23rd at Library of Congress. Uh, we have a call of submissions. Please go contribute. Uh, I heard we've got great people there. People like this. Uh, people like uh, this. Uh, people like this. I heard great people will be here. Uh, and more people are joining us. So please, please come. This is about science of science uh, to understand how we use data and uh, you know, the techniques from network science or data science to understand how science works. With that, you know, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay.